The first condition of self-esteem is role models. Role models. Where are your mirror images? Who do you know in your culture? Can you speak the language? Do you know the food? Do you know the music? We need role models. All of us do. Adoptive parents need them. Successful adoptive parents, birth first parents need them for people. I love what San Bernardino and Riverside are doing. They have hired birth first parents who have managed to get their children back from the system, hired them to help the next set of parents whose kids are in the system to get their kids out. They're mentoring them, giving them role models. So one of the things that children need are role models. They can't, if they're disconnected from their language, from their culture, it's extremely difficult. Okay, so role models, number one. Number two, a sense of uniqueness. N not because you're adopted, not because you're a certain skin color, just because you need to find out who you are and why you're here. One of the things we always say to anybody is, there are no two people ever alike. There will never be another Linda. There never was anybody like you, and there never will be anybody like you, so why the heck are you walking the planet? You need to find out what makes this person unique and support them. And that might mean a lot of experimenting, trying things on and moving on. Does that make sense? We have a lot of people who have been disconnected, who have to try on a variety of experiences as they grow to be able to find their niche, even more than those of us who grew up in our families of origin and we could look at the role models and we knew our family was musical or artistic or whatever they were and we could kind of follow in their, in their flow, but what if you don't have that? How do you find that? So a sense of uniqueness. And the fourth condition is belonging. It's belonging. Who belongs to me and who do I belong to? One of my mantras with families all the time is, it isn't important if your child belongs to you. What's important is do you belong to your child, no matter what. If they go to prison, if they go into treatment centers, if they don't live up to your dreams and whatever, do, can you make a commitment that no matter what, I belong to you, you can't get rid of me. This isn't about divorce. Besides, if you get a divorce, they live in your family for the rest of their lives anyway. Just, that's, that's the truth. They may not be there, but they live in everybody's memory and they talk about them. Do you remember when you were married to so-and-so? Do you remember when so-and-so used to do that? They, when we're divorced, they're still around. So the truth is, we need to know who we belong to and who belongs to us. Okay. So if you think about the things that Sharon was saying, if we take one of those, like role models. If I'm your son, where are, and these have to be real people, not like somebody I see on TV. Where are those lived role models that can emulate that culture that I came from? I came from there, and now I'm in a place that feels dissimilar to me. Where can I get those needs met? Where are those connections? Where do we, and how do you as the parents help him have, a, have access to get those needs met? Does he have those relationships? Can we help him find some of those relationships? Sometimes, especially if it's not from the culture that you're from, having what we call a, a culture broker. Like, where's that culture broker? Someone from that, has to be from that culture. It can't be someone we just go, oh, they're, they're like me, or they're in this, you know, or they're Caucasian. Like, it has to be from that culture, a culture broker. So it's almost like, if you imagine that I'm from this culture, um, you're, you're outside of that. He needs somebody inside that culture. So I'm like building a bridge so he can get back to that part of himself mm -hmm. that he has to discover, which can meet those four things that Sharon was talking about. So thinking about belonging. Does he feel like he belongs here? Maybe he feels like, well, I sh look like I should belong there. By the way, I have this, this issue right now with a young girl from China that I'm with. And she's here, she was adopted from China, but she said, I, people look at me from like, other Chinese people look at me like I'm Chinese and I don't feel Chinese. I don't know the language. I don't feel like that. that's a part of myself that I know. So in some ways, she said, I look in the mirror and I feel, who is that person that I see in the mirror? It doesn't feel like me. She feels disconnected from her culture of origin. 
So imagine if I'm going to help my son feel a sense of belonging to his culture of origin, how do we work to help him have those role models, that connection, that sense of belonging to this place from where he comes, so he can know what's called positive racial identity. So it doesn't feel, and he'll most likely be someone that's navigating um, in and out of various cultures because he's being raised also in your home, right? So he's going to have to be somebody that can go in and out of various <coughs> cultures. But you can see there's a need for him, right? How does he develop a positive racial identity when he's disconnected from that culture? I'm a great believer, and I know Alice is too, that nobody should leave home, go off to college, go into the military, get married, have children, whatever it is. Nobody should leave home without every bit of information that the family has access to. Better they get upset and need therapy while they're still in the family than they're leaving home and working on it at college. So I'm a great believer that you start really early planning to make trips back to the country of origin, um, that it's good for parents to feel like the odd man out, if you will, to be in the middle of a culture where they stand out and their child suddenly doesn't. Um, I think that it's important to go back and create those um, mirror images for, for them. And I also believe, but I'm outrageous about this, I think if you're going to take a child from another country, you should learn the language and help that child maintain their connection to the family of origin. I think adults have to do the adapting, not the kids. And I think that we need to learn their language from whence they come so that when they do go back to visit, they can communicate. Parents that adopt are not adopted. Parents with children, much of what children get from parents, they get vertically. I want you to think about what children absorb in the family system. The roles and the rituals and the relationship, they absorb a lot. Their belief systems, their religion, their, think about what they're absorbing. It's what we call vertical identity. Children are absorbing from their parents. When the child has something that is really dissimilar to the parent, and we didn't make this up, by the way. I think one of my brain crushes, um, Andrew Solomon, who wrote an amazing book called Far From the Tree. And he said that, this, that the child that has something really dissimilar, and I think adoption is something that's really dissimilar, where it's a very unique lived experience. Andrew Solomon wasn't talking about adoption. He was talking about he was himself a gay individual and knew at a very early age. And received from his parents a lot of shaming messages vertically into his identity. And he came up with this concept of a horizontal identity, the part of the identity that he had to go out to his peers that had something similar to him, a positive piece of his identity that he needed to be confirmed and validated and worked through horizontally that he'd never get vertical. And I think adoption is something pretty similar. It's often why when I'm sitting in a room with adoptees, it's like fire, like it's like, you know, amazing, like, like a sister and brother. <laughs> Because they're in a room with other folks that have such a unique experience and they get this horizontal need for identity validation really met. And one of the things that it makes me think about, and especially, and again, and I, I kind of intro this because most of the time if you're not adopted, we, the tendency is to minimize that experience across the lifespan. To be like, oh, it's you know, kind of similar to, mm -hmm. it's very unique. So the, the, and I get asked the question, and so Sharon and I was searching for you, like when does the adoptee actually start searching? And I think they start searching from the moment of separation. And from the moment of separation, what are they searching for? Because sometimes the parent goes, well, they're searching for the birth parent. That's what they're searching for. What they're searching for, you know, kind of generally, holistically, is the search for self. I'm looking for me. I'm looking for me, and I need all parts of me. So if I'm from China, take me back to China 10 times. I'm looking for me. Give me access to the parts of me. Take me back to that culture. Uh, I, I long for all of these parts of me. So even if it's, you know, I've searched and I found my birth, first mother, birth, first father. It's nice, I see them, and I, but really, again, what I'm looking for is me. I'm looking for me. And all of us are searching for self but we make it 50 times harder for adoptees because they lose so much. So that unique adoptee experience, remember the vertical and the horizontal, because it's a very unique experience. Um, the other that we don't think about very often is going back to either our parents who didn't know any better. I remember my mother saying at almost 90, you know, I did the best I could, I didn't know. If I 
sat with my kids and that I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the core issues. Okay. If I sat with them today, I would say, you know, me and culpa, I did a I did a terrible thing. I, I didn't know. I did the best I could. I was already a social worker working in the field and I was making terrible mistakes. Things evolve, things change. What I know today, I didn't know then. I'm sorry. What can I do? So part of it is to be able to go back to the people who are committed to you, to whom you do feel you belong, and say, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying to you that you ruined me or you were horrible parents. What I'm saying to you is that we all suffered the same deficit. There were pieces of information missing. And what would really, really help me, because I know you love me, is if you could do some of the following things for me. And to be able to get some direction on what it is that you need that's missing. Is it touch? Is it rocking? Is it validation? Is, is it, no matter what, I'm yours? Um, uh, is it saying, I don't want you to say anything and I don't want you to have to fix it. I just want you to listen to what I lost. And I want you to cry with me. And if it isn't your parents, if, it, if, if they aren't there to do that with you, then find an adult that, that you trust, that you could go to and say, I really need you to be with me on this. I need you to make a commitment to me to help me move through my fears of rejection and my shame that I carry. And I, want you, I don't want you, you don't have to fix it. I want you to show me that I matter, that I'm valuable to you. We were especially mindful of the adoptee community because again, they carry the most weight and pain of all the core issues. In the back of each chapter, we very specifically wrote strategies to address. It's work to do it, but if you actually looked, like in our, at the end of our loss, once you figure out the ambiguous, the vicarious, the secondary losses, you have to identify all of that. Otherwise, it's so ambiguous, you're like, well, I don't know even where to begin, because it feels like that. Like, it feels like it's like, a, like Mount Everest. Where do I start? It's a roadmap. So you start with loss, and the loss means you have to name them. You have to get very specific. You can't just go, well, I'm not really sure what I lost. I oh, know. you got to get very specific That's where the pain is. Because the devil's in the details. Yeah. To say I lost my birth family is huge. To say I lost somebody who looked like me. I lost the information of where I got my green eyes. I lost the smell of my family. I lost having somebody from my family at my first birthday party. I lost the school I would have gone to if I'd grown up there. I lost the friends I didn't get to know. It's the devil in the details. And, and we have provided a roadmap in the book, but you have to be willing to take the time out to do the work. All, all difficult information, all difficult information, should always start from a, what I would call a, um, a floodlight, a floodlight as opposed to a spotlight. Why do people have abusive families? Why do people become alcoholics? Why do people use drugs? Why, you know, why are people homeless? You, you start with looking at what in our society creates those situations for anybody before you make it personal. So you always start from a floodlight perspective. You know, part of your story includes some sad information and let me explain how folks who get caught up with that sad story, how come they got there? Let me tell you a little bit about what we know about why people may end up on the street or on drugs or violent or uh, unable to hold a job or living in poverty or getting pregnant time and time again and not being able to raise their children. How does that happen? So you give a, a larger look before you make it personal. And you pretend that you're building, you know, when you look at medical books and, you know, they, it starts out with a skeleton and then you overlay and, you know, some, some organs go in there and then you overlay and now maybe there's some nerves and muscles. Is this making sense? You're building on top of it. That's how we talk to our kids about, about any of these stories.